fighter pilot Quentin Annenson of Laverne, Minnesota, had been helping provide air cover for American troops on the ground ever since D-Day. Through all that time, his anchor to sanity had been the belief that Jackie Greer, the girl he'd met while in training in Louisiana, would marry him if he survived the war. Following that war was the best history lesson I ever had. I got a big map, and every day I'd get, I had my crayons out. Every day, certain colors meant this, this group is here, certain colors are this, and uh, I, I kept up with that war. I learned more about Europe than I had ever learned in school. It was very important that I stay with it. Annenson and Greer exchanged letters every two or three days each trying to keep the other's spirits up till they could be together again. Annenson had survived a bad fire in his plane, was haunted by the fear that he had once mistakenly fired on British or American troops, nearly died when his plane hurtled toward its target so fast his instruments froze. When he managed to pull out of his dive, at 600 miles per hour, blood vessels in his eyes burst, and blood trickled from his ears. Meanwhile, his friends kept dying. Two of the guys that lived in my tent were killed. There were just four of us in there, and two of them were killed. I had been listed as missing in action because I had been so badly shot up, I had to land on a temporary airfield closer to the front lines. Johnny Bathurst and I, who were the survivors in Duffy's Tavern, our tent there, decided that we couldn't deal with that anymore. So we quit making friends, new friends. On December 5th, 1944, the impact of all that Anderson had seen and experienced overcame him. And he started writing Jackie a very different kind of letter from the ones he had sent before. Dear Jackie, for the past two hours, I've been sitting here alone in my tent, trying to figure out just what I should do and what I should say in this letter in response to your letters and some questions you have asked. I have purposely not told you much about my world over here because I thought it might upset you. Perhaps that has been a mistake, so let me correct that right now. I still doubt if you will be able to comprehend it. I don't think anyone can who has not been through it. I live in a world of death. I have watched my friends die in a variety of violent ways. Sometimes it's just an engine failure on takeoff, resulting in a violent explosion. There's not enough left to bury. Other times, it's the deadly flak that tears into a plane. If the pilot is lucky, the flak kills him. But usually he isn't, and he burns to death as his plane spins in. Fire is the worst. In early September, one of my good friends crashed on the edge of our field. As he was pulled from the burning plane, the skin came off his arms. His face was almost burned away. He was still conscious and trying to talk. You can't imagine the horror. So far, I have done my duty in this war. I have never aborted a mission or failed to dive on a target, no matter how intense the flak. I have lived for my dreams for the future, but like everything else around me, my dreams are dying too. 
In spite of everything, I may live through this war and return to Baton Rouge. But I am not the same person you said goodbye to on May 3rd. No one could go through this and not change. We are all casualties. In the meantime, we just go on. Some way, somehow, this will all have an ending. Whatever it is, I am ready for it. When he had finished his letter, Adamson folded it up and put it away in his footlocker. Mailing it home would only have been cruel to the woman he loved and hoped to marry. If he happened to make it through what was still to come. <laughs> 